why is this happening to her? All this grace, such joy, all of life heeding her bidding, this perfect September day. Once again, Meera raises her face to the sky and smiles. Liquid sunshine melts with distilled fragrances, top notes that tease and waltz. Apples, jasmine, walnuts, roses, musk, wine. A solitary chrysanthemum, the plop of corks, the steady arc of the stream, a cool glass against her cheek. In the Greek myths that Mira loves, there is a goddess who could be her. Hera, wife of Zeus, god among gods and queen of the universe. And right now, Anita Nair is truly the queen of her universe. Her latest book, Lessons in Forgetting, has received rave reviews. And it is a perfect March day indeed. Hmm? It, is. Yes, it is. It is. We were in conversation just last evening at her book launch. And uh, Anita, your first book was published in 1997. And this is Anita's 12th book. So it's almost like a book a year. Uh, you are uh, not only prolific, but also very... Uh, disciplined and a uh, very, uh, you know, dedicated writer. Well, one of the things, of course, is that I am a full-time writer, which means that I don't do anything else but um, write. That is one aspect of it. But also, I think what has contributed to this, um, well, 12 books in 12 years really has been the fact that I was writing long before I was published. So there were all these collections of myths that I'd been working on, um, which went on to become my children's books, which have contributed largely to the corpus of my work. And um, now I think I've come to the rock bottom of that drawer where I had unpublished manuscripts. So I'd probably now become this less prolific writer. <laughs> Uh, but what is it? It's quite a coincidence that a lot of people who've worked in advertising and who've been copywriters, we were talking about this yesterday, Salman Rushdie, Faye Weldon, and you worked in an ad agency too. So is that some sort of a, a stepping stone to becoming a writer? Well, I think one of the things is that, you know, obviously you have to have a certain talent for writing, uh, at least in the time you're talking about Salman Rushdie and Faye Weldon and thereafter as well in my, my generation, etc. And those are the kind of people who ended up doing either journalism or copywriting. And most of the writers who went into copywriting were very definitely sure that what lay in their life was a book and not um, a Clio, which is the, you know, the ultimate advertising award. Um, so I, I think... Uh, several copywriters saw advertising merely as a, you know, the means to an end. And, and apart from anything else, I would think advertising is a wonderful training ground for writers who, who eventually will go on to become full-time writers. It teaches you to write very precisely. And it teaches you dedication, discipline, very importantly. Because, you know, in advertising, you can't come to work one day and say, I'm not in the mood to write today, I can't work. You have to work, you have to write. So that kind of works into your system and you eventually become a more disciplined writer, which is why I think if you look at Fay Weldon or Salman Rushdie or, Kup, or Peter Mail, who wrote, uh, who's another advertising writer, all of them have been prolific writers. They've all produced several books simply because I think you get used to this discipline of writing. Now, coming to the book more specifically, the cyclone is the motive in this book. Mm -hmm. And all your books do have a, a recurring theme or a motive. How did the cyclone happen? Well, in this case, you know, I wanted to write uh, about chaos in life, unpredictability in life, and when it happens, what do we do? How do we deal with it? And I needed uh, um, a metaphor that would work well within the context of the book and also lend itself to the narrative structure that is some, something that has become part of my writing style where I try and work in the metaphor into the structure itself and so I was groping around for a metaphor and then I happened to meet a friend of mine who at that point um, was working on a film on cyclones and so we met for coffee and we were talking about it and she was describing her experience and suddenly it just fell into place that this would be the metaphor that I wanted to use. Uh, so the cyclone became a metaphor that I wanted to use because one, 
the character in my book, the main, the protagonist, is a is a expert. He's a science um, or a weather expert, and cyclones became more particularly the area that he concentrated on. And the structure of a cyclone is such that it just made itself uh, perfect for the the nature of this novel and what its narrative structure was going to be. So it was like one of those perfect fits. So what triggered off the narrative in, in the case of Lessons in Forgetting? Was it a character? Was it an incident? Uh, just a, a feeling, a thought, a mood? What uh, triggered off the okay. narrative? Okay, well, you know, I think one of the things is that we always think that a disaster has to kind of announce itself. Disaster happens because we kind of uh, create situations in life and which is why we end up having disasters. It probably is true of natural phenomenon to a certain extent. But here are two people whose lives are suddenly devastated for really no faults of their own, you know. I mean, they haven't really contributed to what has happened, which again goes back to a cyclone. You know, when a cyclone strikes a coast, it's not really the fault of the people who live there that a cyclone has struck them. But they still have to deal with it. They still have to go on with their lives and they still have to kind of, uh, you know, come out of it and rebuild. So in that sense, uh, you know, it's, it, I think in the, in, the, in the creative process, several of these thoughts exist in separate pockets. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly there is this specific moment when all of it comes together and you think like, it just seems so right, why didn't I think of it in, in one shot? Why did I have to grope around for it? So that was lessons in forgetting. I think the book launch yesterday was lovely. Did you feel nice about it? I think you had a very rapt audience. Yes, I actually it. enjoyed myself and um, l later in the night my publisher had called me up to find out how it went and I was telling it was one of the uh, nicest book events I've done because um, I guess my uh, uh, delight at being there was quite transparent. <laughs> <laughs> and and Madras has very serious readers too. Yeah, yeah very dedicated, dedicated book club we have yes. here. And apparently Anita was dreaming about the carrot cake last night. <laughs> <laughs> well, I came here some some time ago and had this carrot cake. And I enjoyed it perfectly and I kept thinking when I go back next time to Shemias, this is exactly what I'm going to have. So we'll, we'll take a little break because I'm going to let her read some of what she's been yearning for. <laughs> Let's do that. Let's take a break. I'm in conversation with Anita Nair. <laughs> 